Welcome to episode 168 of Five and Dive. It is September 17th. I am your host, Craig Goldstein, Editor-in-Chief of Baseball Prospectus. Joining me is my co-host today, back for the second time. Uh, you'll remember him from the trade deadline breakdown spectacular, Zach Kreiser. Uh, I, I probably still don't remember your title, Zach. MLB Editor at Yahoo Sports, is that... Yes, MLB editor, baseball editor, something to that effect. Yeah, editor for baseball things at Yahoo Sports. Thank you for uh, for joining me on a Friday morning. I appreciate it. Yep, thank you. We'll we'll talk less this time. <laughs> Almost guaranteed. There's not nearly as much to talk about. Uh, our first segment. I can tell Jeff has been uh, into the children's book uh, books uh, with his title here, Redbird, Redbird. What do you see? Uh, the Cardinals swept the Mets. They are now in the second wild card spot. And my worst fears, I think I talked about this a couple weeks ago on the podcast, uh, are coming true that the you know the Dodgers are going to finish like 20 games up on uh, the Cardinals in, in the wild card and lose to them, you know, lose to some god awful Adam Wainwright uh, performance in, in the wild card and eliminate. They're very good season. Um, that's my fear as a Dodgers fan. It it is currently uh, the situation. I did you did you foresee this? Uh, I feel like I can't I can't say that the Cardinals have grabbed this despite the sweep from the from the, of the Mets. It feels more like the wild card too has come to them. Is that a fair? I just yeah. feel like every other team has faltered more than they've seized this. Yeah, they're they're uh, emanating devil magic and uh, <laughs> using them as hooks now instead of like lifting themselves. But yeah, exactly. The something about the Cardinals is just like you know they're going to be steady, and if everyone else screws up, the Cardinals will be there. And I, I'll tell you how much I didn't expect it. I wrote uh, an article right after the trade deadline about like ranking the talent levels of every team that could possibly contend still. And I'll tell you, the Cardinals were not in that article. So uh, definitely missed on that one. I think the I had the Angels and Mariners in there, but not the Cardinals. So uh, I thought they were toast. Um, and yeah, see, but again, the, the, the Angels and Mariners are better teams, maybe? Maybe the not. Angels aren't, Maybe, but yeah, yeah. I mean, the, and by run differential, neither are. But by by record, I mean, yeah. I guess the 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 Mariners are the Angels are not. But but the but again, like the Mariners are in a competitive wild card, and I feel like the competition in this wild card is who who wants it the least. It, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like it's just it. Like you said, there's competence from from St. Louis, but it's not. You know, the Padres are starting. Vince Velasquez today, they started Jake Arrieta in a crucial, like a big series against the Giants, which they managed to split uh, with a bullpen game in Joe Musgrove. Uh, I don't even know what's happening with the Reds. I don't, I, they, they seemingly have the wild card every fourth day and then drop a game or two back. Um, and, and we'll get into the, the Phillies. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's just the team. I don't know. They, that we, I know I mock them for going and getting Jay Happ and John Lester and having an entire rotation that throws under 90 miles per hour. Uh, that's that's a little different now with Jake Woodford uh, in the rotation and Wade LeBlanc hurt. But those guys have been fine. Uh, the bats have been there. You know, Nolan Arenado has been fine. Goldschmidt is hitting. He's on a hot streak of late. Um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the rest of this team. It's it, Dylan Carlson has picked it up a little bit. Harrison Bader's been about a league average hitter. Tyler O'Neill has maintained his breakout. He's been very um, good. Uh, yeah, and he, you know who else has been good for them? They've done the thing where they just like replace their shortstop spontaneously without losing the first one again. Like Edmundo Sosa has like an 850 <laughs> OPS suddenly. Yeah. And it's just like when DeYoung came out of nowhere and was like, sorry, Ledmus Diaz, you're gone. The He's same thing now happened to DeYoung. since the deadline. Yeah, it's, it's I, you know, I don't, I don't understand why this happens, but. Yeah, I mean, Sosa was always, he was like, what, like routinely in the back half or just off the, the Cardinals top I wrote him as the 11th guy. best Cardinals prospect for like four years in a row, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and and he was always interesting, but yeah, I mean, to, to Jeff's point, since the trade deadline, uh, which is, you know, August 1st to, to September 15th, that was the last game he played, 
344, 411, 559 for a 970 OPS since the break. Uh, it's nice when you can just have that happen. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's the Cardinals, but it's also their pitching. Uh, you know, Adam Adam Wainwright has a 167 ERA since the deadline. Like I said, Happ and Lester, uh, as uninspiring as they are, it's, it's kept the Cardinals from doing what the Padres have had to do, which is, you know, claim... I mean, what, they started Adrian Sampson against the Rockies, I think, one day. They, they've they been starting Jake Arrieta when healthy. Uh, they're starting Vince Velasquez, as I said. The the Cardinals haven't had to do that, uh, which seems like a big deal uh, in, in a race like this. Uh, they're also getting bullpen help from, you know, they uh, Giovanni Gallegos is, is, I think, the nominal closer with, with Alex Reyes struggling a little bit. But Luis Garcia, who we were just talking about before the show, had a 7.56 ERA for Texas last year. Uh, he's up to 20... Two innings in uh, where he hasn't given a run, given up a run now. An ERA of of uh, well, it's right for two one three on the season. Twenty six strikeouts in twenty five innings. I mean, this is is this Cardinals devil magic? It's it's not as obvious as we tend to see it, but I feel like it's uh, I feel like we're in at least in in the ballpark here. Yeah, I mean, maybe uh, if everyone saw the Tyler Kepner article about uh, Adam Wainwright the other day, maybe Adam Wainwright has just solved all of these pitchers' problems by teaching them to play catch with intention. <laughs> Some, like, just straight out of a... Ni- I said this to Greg on Chat already, but straight out of, like, some quote. 1950s baseball book that's just, like, the key to success is being able to play catch. And it's like, <laughs> really? But... Uh, you know, he was talking a little bit more about playing catch intentionally to fit it within like a hula hoop size. A hula hoop, but, yeah. But either way, I mean, I just don't, I don't know. I, I think what you said is basically, it mostly comes down to durability. They went and got like two guys in their late 30s who never miss a start ever. So they at least guaranteed that they have competent-ish major league starters, whereas the Padres are pulling dregs out of teams that can't pitch themselves. So, I, you know, there's something to be said for that, and that in this particular wildcard race where everyone is falling on their face around them, that is enough at the moment. Yeah, and I think there's something to uh, the idea that bullpens at this point in the season, coming off a short season... Uh, with with all the usage they get, you know, all year now are are just done. You know, a lot of bullpens are pretty burnt out, and getting your four and a half to five and a half innings from Lester and Hap when you know whatever they can give you is uh, better than than the situation a lot of other teams are in. You know what I mean? Like I I just think a lot of these. A lot of these pitchers in these bullpens are are overexposed and and overused coming off a, a short season, which makes I, you know you, you mentioned Adam Wainwright in that article, but like maybe he has solved something. I mean, he's thirty nine. He's coming off a season. He's bumped his innings by a hundred and twenty five innings this year. He has a two eight eight ERA. He's absolutely solved something for himself. I'm just wondering <laughs> if he's spread it like I, you know. Uh, he is doing something good. I mean, he is pitching and keeping guys off balance and using the pitches he still does have to great effect. I mean, he still has his fastball. It's just not very fast. So he's using all the other pitches to compensate for that. And, you know, a lot of wily control and command stuff that is, you know, we call it wily or kind of look down upon it, but, like, it's working and it, it is... Uh, it- yeah. It's effective for now it, while he still can do it. It's it's crafty lefty stuff from a, from a righty. Uh, Who used to be just an ace, right. Yeah. Um, so on the Cardinals, can they hold off? I mean, I mean, it's like hold off. None of these teams are really pushing them. But Cincinnati, San Diego, Philadelphia. Uh, Philadelphia is two and a half back. Cincinnati one back. San Diego half a game back of the Cardinals right now who who you know does does St. Louis come away with it do you like someone better than St. Louis somehow well I will say you know it's hard to look at anything except the schedule at this point and the the Cardinals uh from let's take it from next Friday let's say have the Cubs 
including a doubleheader, and then they play the Brewers at home, and then they play the Cubs again. The Padres have the Dodgers. Good luck with that. Yeah, Padres' and schedule Braves, is brutal. And then the Giants. So I don't love the Padres. Um, the Reds have the Nationals, the White Sox, and the Pirates. So in you know logic world, the Reds would be big competition, but I I kind of do just like the Cardinals. I don't know. I don't really understand what's happening with the Reds. They've <laughs> they've done one of their like. You know, over the past three, four years, they've been an offensive team and then a pitching team and then an offense team and then a pitching team again and never both at the same time. And I feel like they're just like undergoing one of those painful changes like mid season right now and it's not working. Yeah, it's weird because they do kind of so the Reds get the Dodgers tonight, I think, too, mm-hmm. which is not I you know, not necessarily not ideal great. timing. But you know, it's it's Luis Castillo versus uh versus Walker Bueller, which should be a, a good game overall. Certainly a game that they can win. I mean, this has been a, a strong lineup throughout the year. And then you have Castillo, once he figured things out after the first couple months. Uh, Sonny Gray has generally been pretty good. Uh, you know, like their, their rotation, Tyler Molly has been uh, solid. Like their rotation has been good and they're not short of pitchers. It's kind of just been their bullpen for the most part, that I feel like has has let them down. Uh, I did want to touch on Philly, who who uh, we didn't touch on too much here. Uh, no no chance for them. They're two and a, I mean two and a half back in I think sixteen games to play something like that. Uh, you you don't see any chance for them. Well, I think they play the Braves, and I almost think if they're gonna do it, they're gonna have to do it in the NL East. I'm not really sure, but I don't give them a great chance just because. Three out of the five days of the week, their pitching is a trash fire. <laughs> um, but they so. went and got Kyle Gibson. Yep, he's in there. He's one of the three of the five. Uh, uh, yeah, the the Phillies. So so the interesting part on the Phillies is they get seven games coming up. Starting. Uh, oh no, I'm sorry. So they get the Mets starting tonight in a in a three game series. Then they get seven games starting on Monday. Against the Orioles and the Pirates mm-hmm. before finishing with the Braves. Didn't they get swept by the Rockies and Diamondbacks recently? <laughs> uh, they did. They they lost three of four to the to the Rockies, um, uh, yeah. uh, and two of three to the Marlins. Uh, yeah, the, the, I wouldn't say things have gone great great for them recently. Um, but you know, just saying, they have the Orioles and the Pirates, which are winnable games. Uh, they've been a mess. Did you did you happen to see Didi Gregorius' comments? I know he he previously said he thought the 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 vaccine that he got gave him pseudo gout or whatever it was, and now he said he I, he doubled down on this and said it's giving him elbow problems or something. Yes. I mean, does he know the shot didn't go into his elbow? Like, what? Why would I don't know? I it just the Phillies are. They are, I, I've had this th- thread throughout the year that I said, like, the Phillies can't play a normal game, and God bless them for it. I mean, last night could not be... They went down 7 nothing to the Cubs in the first inning or the first two innings, something like that. They ended up winning 17-8. to um, I frankly don't know how, if you're a Phillies fan, you're functioning this season. Like, I, you, your cholesterol has to be through the roof. Well, I we mean, got a Mets Philly series this weekend, so yeah, I don't think it's possible. Every single game has been bizarre. Sorry, Zach, go ahead. I think, you know, evidence uh, the Athletics Phillies writer, Matt Geld, sounds like he applied for a transfer months ago and is just like going <laughs> gradually more insane with every game. He deserves but, one. This no one no yeah. one does this feels like some sort of psychological experiment, you know, like the Stanford experiment <laughs> or something like that. Like is Milgram running the the Phillies? I that's yeah, I don't know. Maybe a deep cut for people. But God, I mean it is it is like there's they're, they're getting shocked on the other end of this uh you know the fans are, the the Phillies are just turning a dial seeing how much they can you know harm harm the fans uh um, you can push a button we'll go... and take a shock or alternatively you get to watch Hector Norris pitch in the eighth in a tie game <laughs> <laughs> or you get to watch Ronald Torres start at third base and actually be the best idea 
Yeah, man, poor poor Alec Baum. I did not yeah. I did not see that coming. I I thought he could at least hit. I didn't think he'd field well, but I thought he could at least hit. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna stay in the NL East for a second segment uh, with rule number one. It's about a multitude of people that extends far beyond yourself that you have compromised because you had this insatiable appetite to disseminate a tweet. You don't know better than that. Uh, I'll be honest. I, so I, I, Zach, you know this about me. I, I stay up late and I wake up late. And I woke up yesterday to a lot of conversation in my G chats about like what was happening with the Mets. And I was like, oh God, what now? And it was just Steve Cohen. What is Steve Cohen doing? Um. Well, to the, te- the technical ex- term, Craig, is he's posting. <laughs> right. To explain for anyone who did not see this, uh, Mike Puma of the New York Post wrote an article in which he quoted an anonymous executive from somewhere in the game, former executive, something, saying that Cohen's tweets would be a problem for any legitimate GM or president of baseball operations type that uh, he tried to hire. And Cohen responded to this by basically issuing a reward for figuring out who the anonymous executive was, and He's on put Twitter, out a manhunt. For, for... <laughs> at which at, at this point, lots of Twitter people took the very obvious route of guessing that a spicy former executive quote came from David Sampson, the former Marlins executive. Uh, that is a pretty good guess usually, but I turned out to not be wrong or to, to not be right. Uh, and so then Cohen of course assumed it was right. And I think offered several people a seat in his box with him at some point for their erroneous guesses. Um, so that's where we ended up with that. I don't think it helped his case that he's a normal person with a Twitter. Um, so I, I honestly thought maybe the most offensive part of the whole thing was Samson issuing a denial and capitalizing the name of his podcast. I mean, I mean in, the most in the po- amazing the thing is he quote tweeted Cohen's initial tweet like, oh, there's a lot of sources out there, which is definitely something a person that didn't give that quote would do. <laughs> <laughs> and then in his, de- in his denial, he never actually said he wasn't the person that gave the quote. He kind of talked around it. Yeah, with the last I don't know if he is or isn't, but it, he really did. Mike Puma yeah. said he was not. Yeah. Right, Mike Puma went out and said he yeah. wasn't. Yeah. Which is also an interesting decision, I think, from Mike Puma. I mean, to just to even wade into it at all, right? Wouldn't I just feel like at some point you would just be like, "I'm not talking about it." Like, I don't talk about my sources whatsoever. But I think yeah, he probably I just wanted know. to clarify that he doesn't talk to David Sampson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess I'd want that on the record too. <laughs> please, please don't, please don't assume I'm talking to David Sampson. My favorite uh, part, I think, so there's also a part which is like, uh, who, who is this? Like, I don't even know who David Sampson is. Like, clearly you do, but he's yeah, trying to be I like mean, the Conor McGregor. All... Who the fuck is this guy? And it's just not working. <laughs> and like, I think a couple months ago during the Kumar Rocker thing, he said, "Oh, this was actually a smart decision." Like David Sampson wrote about. Like, I mean, like, come on, you got to keep on, track of your own posting at least. Uh, so to follow up on this. Uh, Ken Rosenthal came out with an article just this morning suggesting that the Mets, in need of stability and experience, should try to hire uh, Billy Bean and Bob Melvin from the Oakland A's. A lot of the thrust of the article was that uh, a, a, a Billy Bean and uh, Sandy Alderson reunion would uh, be appealing to to Billy Bean. Obviously, they've worked together uh in in Oakland for quite a long time, and and I think I guess New York before that, um, and that Melvin would be I guess a culture shift for, for from the manager position, uh, and obviously has has worked with being a long time. I, uh, yeah, I guess I don't know what what do you, what do you think about this, Zach? What was your take on on this uh, suggestion? Well, you know, I think it's clearly a suggestion, and it seems like, well, it seems like a couple things. It seems like Ken is trying to find a nice way, uh, which he's he's said it pretty straight up a couple other times, but this seems like a nice way of saying that 
Sandy's probably now uh, burned his chances and is out of his depth, and someone needs to find uh, a way to actually push him out of the decision-making picture, and maybe if Cohen is insistent on keeping Alderson around next year, one way to you know, move along is to bring in someone like Billy Bean who actually has his trust and then Melvin, I mean, yeah, Melvin would be a good idea for literally any team to hire. So sure, (laughs) hire him. That'd be great. But the realism of this doesn't really, yeah, I don't see it happening. I mean, there's plenty of paragraphs about how all of the A's stuff is, you know, could encourage with them trying to leave Oakland and with the stadium confusion and everything, and with them being a small market, could make Billy Bean and Bob Melvin want to leave. Uh, but they haven't yet. They've been there forever. What is right. so different right now? There's also these huge you know, caveats about Billy Bean living there his whole life and having a 13-year-old daughter, having 13-year-old daughters in the area. Bob Melvin is from California, despite having lived in Manhattan at one point. Uh, it just, I don't yeah, really the, the see any ch- particular I, impetus. I did really like the, the draw for Bob Melvin was he bre- he played for the Yankees for a bit. I was like, oh, well, that's not the same, but I guess, okay. Uh, um, it's, yeah, I just, I don't see it as an actual, unless like Billy Bean and Bob Melvin are looking for either raises. Maybe the person most mad about this is John Fisher. But, uh, right. you know, unless they're looking for raises or they're actually interested, yeah, I, I don't. Which I mean, I don't good think for their agents block. if they pitch yeah. this article, to be honest. Uh, yeah, but, but, but I, yeah, I guess the other interesting part to me is, like, why do... I'm sure... This is maybe going to sound callous. I, but, like, I'm sure Billy Bean wants... Uh, you know, I'm sure, based on his career and everything, likes Sandy Alderson quite a bit. Uh, again, they've worked together uh, numerous times and for extended periods of time. But, like, it kind of seems seems like this is a suggestion that Billy Bean uproot everything about his life to save Sandy Alderson's reputation. Yeah, to clean up his mess or to, you know, it just doesn't seem like an appealing situation like what's to in walk it for into Billy for Bean, a... Aside from money. Right. And he's fine. He, and he's, he's... he's a part owner of... <laughs> He's got an ownership Billy's. stake in Oakland. He so is like, an absolute lock for the Hall of Fame. He is going to be associated with the A's. I don't understand. Like This is not the pre-World Series Cubs or Red Sox job. As much as everyone wants to make it seem like it is some huge, you walk into the Mets and make them competent or win a World Series and you're a legend. Like It's just not that. It is... Even if you did that, you'd probably get canned two years later when your manager wrecked an ATV or something. Like, it is just, an you know, this is not that level of prestige job. And, so it, and it's a terrible situation to walk into right away. So I don't really understand why an executive like Billy Bean would leave the place where his legacy is just, like, ironclad for that. Well, and, and the last part of it for me being... Uh... It seems like Billy Bean might just be checked out on baseball to some degree. Like he's like consulting on soccer stuff. Uh, he he's leading a SPAC that almost bought into the Reds, like uh, Fenway Sports Group, that fell through. But like it doesn't really seem like he might just want to be a business executive and not a baseball executive, which he basically point, is like. right now. David Force basically runs that show based on everything we can tell. Right, and the other part about bringing Billy Bean in is like. I mean, again, if you're also if you're trying to fix the culture, like bringing in Sandy Alderson's longtime protege might not be the culture shift you're thinking it is. Uh, but but secondly, like he's going to have to hire a GM also, presumably, because he's again, he's not really he doesn't really want to run the team. You'd uh, you know, you'd bet on his chances of it doing better than uh, Alderson sure, at this sure. point. But sure. uh, yes. that's not a particularly high bar. Uh, yeah. So I, you know, suffice it to say, I, I, I don't think any of this happened. Do you think, uh, do you think they can lure Theo? It seems like Theo's plan one, and maybe this is, I don't know, somewhere down the list, but. I, I don't think they will lure Theo, no. Yeah. All right. Uh, all right. Our third segment on the show, 
Uh, the team that made Milwaukee famous. Uh, last last podcast, uh, Bradford and I touched on uh, a couple teams that we hadn't talked about in a while, just because they were uh, winning their divisions handily and and didn't there wasn't a lot of drama. Uh, another one of those is the the Milwaukee Brewers. Um, you you know the Brewers quite a bit. I I, I mean they are. Running away with their division, uh, they're eighty nine and fifty seven, twelve and a half games ahead of uh, Wildcard Two holders, St. Louis Cardinals. Um, is this, you know, the the pitching is obviously very good. Freddie Peralta had a had a brief reprieve uh, on the ten day IL, which I imagine he might not have gotten if if they weren't ahead by double digit games. Um, obviously, Corbin Burns and Brandon Woodruff are. Are very good. I think one of the more surprising things to me has been the the quality of the lineup for for this team, at least post Willie Adamas trade. Yes, uh, definitely post Willie Adamas trade. And, and look, there are still weaknesses and uh, some skepticism around how good this lineup is. Christian Yelich has not been back to peak form. You know, they went through like seven guys to get to Luis Urias being like pretty okay. Uh, and you still have the uh, Daniel Vogelbach, Rowdy Telez, <laughs> revolving door of portly first baseman. It's, I was going to say, it's, um, it's a very wide door. <laughs> this yeah. is a pro big boy podcast, just so you know, Zach. <laughs> <laughs> the big boys have been fine. I don't, I mean, Vogelbach's been very good. I, I just, I don't know why or if I believe it, but, uh, it, you know, yes, this is a good team. I don't, uh, I think this front office has quietly been one of the most, maybe not quietly, has been one of the most successful over the past five years. I think they do a lot of really smart things. I think they have especially, I, I, you know, would still characterize their pitching development as the most important thing they've done recently. But, I mean, look, they're getting a career season out of Colton Wong. Uh, and plucked him from the Cardinals. The es- Eduardo Escobar fit a good role that they've usually had, this multi-positional infielder who is bat first but can satisfy a lot of needs on defense. This is from the team that played Travis Shaw at second base. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I, I think it's a good team, and uh, I think we're going to get into whether you want to face them in the postseason. I think the short answer is definitely not. Uh, I think this is a really, really scary team in October. Yeah, I mean, I, I honestly, last year when Milwaukee uh, faced the, the Dodgers in the expanded postseason, uh, this was not even this good a team, obviously, by the by the record, uh, but, but even just on talent. Uh, and I thought the Dodgers dodged a big bullet when Corbin Burns came up with a oblique injury right before the series because it's a three-game series and, and Milwaukee got Brandon Woodruff and Corbin, you know, w- was going to throw Woodruff and Burns. Um, and, Wood, you know, the Dodgers came out ahead on the Woodruff game, but it was it was a tight one and it was, it was uh, you know, while he was in, it was, it was you know, very, very close and, and very much in question. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think the big loss is all of Christian Yelich's power has has basically disappeared. I, I don't know if or how you, you fix that. I think one of the weirder things, I hadn't even noticed, they are kind of platooning Vogelback and Tellez, like you said, but they're both lefties. I don't, I don't really understand what they're how that's working, but I guess it it is working. Um, and and, and we, I will say, yeah. Telez is hurt right now, and I, yeah. I don't really know what his status is, so maybe that won't matter. But yeah, yeah, and it's just a bunch of solid. I mean, I think the the Escobar trade, which you brought up, is is kind of underrated. He's had a one seventeen OPS plus since he arrived in in Milwaukee. He's at eight nineteen OPS. Um, and like you said, he can kind of fill in all over. He's not defensively great, but they're very good at positioning and they have, you know, very good defenders elsewhere in Wong. I mean, they're essentially playing a shortstop at third base. Uh, not Willie Adams is hurt right now, but again, when you have him, the, the infield defense is exceedingly good. Um, yeah, I mean, this is, yeah, I, I don't want to face this team in the playoffs at all. I mean, do you... You have the Giants and Dodgers posting the best record in the league right now, but would you? How, I, how much would you favor them at all, in, a, in if at all, in a series against Milwaukee? I, I would favor Milwaukee in a series against the Giants. I think the pitching is just so much more 
reliable. Uh, the starting pitching specifically. I mean, yeah. I, actually, the bullpen too. Everything. All the pitching is better. Yeah. Um, you know, Kevin Gaussman was great in the first half and great last year. And, you know, I think he's very, very good. But I don't know. I'm pretty sure he'd be the fourth best pitcher on the Brewers. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> so that's not great, you know? Like, Logan Webb has been excellent, but... You know, at most you feel about the same level of confidence with Freddie Peralta, probably. Uh, and so you're looking at the pitching matchup favoring the Brewers, if especially given they are just 100% locked in to the division series. They do not have to race for anything right now. Right. They can set up their pitching, which they have been doing all year very effectively, which I've written about. They can set up their pitching in the best possible way for them which I would assume goes Burns, Woodruff, Peralta, and then whoever, you know, I could see them piggybacking Hauser and Lauer uh, since they are different handedness, something like that. Uh, You know, those guys set them up in the way they want and rest some of their big bullpen arms like Hayter and Williams. This team could be really, really, really loaded for Bear come postseason. And I mean, Burns has been, you know, Burns and Scherzer are the most dominant pitchers in baseball right now. And yeah, I mean the, the only the Burns would run away with with the with the Cy Young award if he had the innings, twenty that, more innings. Yeah, yeah. twenty yeah twenty thirty more innings, something like that. And I think one thing that's gotten gotten lost. I brought this up to to Jeff recently and and possibly to you. I, I don't. Eric Lauer has a three one ERA and has been like on a tear. He's legit good right now. I. I don't know why either. <laughs> and and Adrian Hauser, who I've always liked, has a three two five ERA. He's got the highest ERA in the Milwaukee rotation. He threw a shutout like two weeks ago. Yeah, yeah uh, he's yeah. been especially. I think he had kind of a rough first half, and he's been amazing since then. If I vaguely remember this season correctly, That's, yeah, he he had some rough rough starts early on. But yeah, I, the the other thing is, I mean, do you know how many guys ten innings? Uh, uh, it, it, look, ten innings is a low threshold. Mm-hmm. Ten innings or more have an ERA under three in the Milwaukee bullpen right oh, now. It's probably like twelve. I don't know. <laughs> no, no uh, I'll guess five. It's six. Oh, it, okay, Hater. Uh, Boxberger, Williams, Hunter Strickland has a one one seven ERA in thirty and two thirds innings. I mean, this when when you fix Hunter Strickland, things are going well. <laughs> Jake Cousins, did you know who Jake Cousins was before this year? Well, no, but now I love Jake Cousins because he's the prime example of nominative determinism in that his cousin is Kirk Cousins. Oh, come on. Is he really? Yeah, no, seriously. That's I true. Just... That is absolutely <laughs> true. <laughs> that's great. That should that should be a, a wider known fun fact. I really <laughs> like that. Uh, he's got a 163 ERA in 27 and two-thirds innings, 40 strikeouts. Yeah, his slider is insane. Uh, Yandel Gustav has 10 innings, uh, has allowed one earned run. I mean, it's it's absolutely... fun fact. He was in the first article I ever wrote for Baseball Prospectus. What well, he, he was? Uh, what he was Houston then, right? Yeah, he was in Houston's Appy League uh, affiliate at and the time. threw like a hundred miles an hour. Yes, I mean he's always been interesting. Um, Aaron Ashby had one of the worst first uh, outings you've ever uh, you've ever <laughs> yeah. seen, I believe. But he's good, uh, and since then has been good. Yeah. And since then has been he threw two thirds of an innings, gave up seven runs, four earned, three walks, no strikeouts. Uh, in his in his debut, uh, he's given up four earned runs total since then in 21 innings. Uh, yeah, they're just freaking incredible. And keep in mind, they they traded uh, Drew Rasmussen and and uh, who's the other guy for for Willie Fire Adams, Eisen. Have, Fire, Fire Eisen, Eisen. Yeah. Uh, who have both been very good for uh, for for Tampa Bay. I mean, it, it, I don't know. I I can't speak to enough to. To what Milwaukee is, and oh yeah, I, and to tie this back to our our second segment, uh, apparently uh, New York is interested in in uh, David Stearns as well. I'm sure uh, they why are. Why would David Stearns ever like? First of all, the expectations in Milwaukee for being in a small market, but but have been competitive over the last few years. Why would you ever leave that for for New York? No, I don't know. And this is not a small market small market this is not a particularly stingy one i mean they no, spend when they need has, to has yeah. gone for i mean look to the point that you mentioned colton wong i mean they went and got him after he lingered on the market they did the same thing with lorenzo kane uh you know and, and i understand kane has they has extended yellich for big money 
Right, right. The extended, which again, maybe, you know, we'll see. They, they went and got Jackie Bradley, which did not work out really, but is, you know, again, they they're, they're yeah. willing to to do these ty- kinds of things. Uh, and, you know, Lorenzo Cain has been not so bad since coming back off the injured list. I, I, I think he's, you know, around a league average bat with, I understand his, his uh, defense is declining a bit uh, in center, but, you know, and overall, I, so, that contract has totally worked out. He was really, right. really good for them for a couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm gonna since he came back in in late July from the injured list, two seventy nine, three thirty six, four fifty one. The Lorenzo Cain season. Yeah, with what yeah. he does in center, that's absolutely worth it. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I yeah, I don't know why he he would he would leave it all. And and I should also th- just mention as as we're uh, ending the topic, I, I think Craig Council is just. An incredibly good manager. Yeah, I he you know the New York Times wrote about this the other day, but I yeah I think he's absolutely the best in baseball right now. Uh, yeah, I, we saw I, it I as back as you know when he almost slayed the Dodgers in 2018 with just with absolute Yoli Chassin yeah. starting two games I or mean, whatever. Wade Miley fake outs. It was just okay. Well, Wade Miley might just be good. We don't. <laughs> well, he wasn't then though. The whole shenanigan was that he didn't even pitch. It's right, just like right. complete managerial fireworks almost beat the Dodgers. And now he doesn't need those even. Uh, yeah, no, I, uh, I I agree. Oh, I, the, the other thing, just uh, again, the last thing. I, I know you wrote about this following up uh, some of Rob Main's work at BP, but like what, what Milwaukee is doing with their rest schedule um, which again is is a combination of the front office and Craig Council and the, and the team buying into it. I didn't know if you wanted to talk about that at all. I thought it was a really interesting, uh, you know, I guess, piece of information and and approach to this season. Sure. I mean, I think the the big takeaway from that article, which I don't have, I haven't updated since then, but I believe it's true based on how far ahead they are. They they have basically used their three big pitchers, especially Woodruff, Burns, and Peralta, on five or more days rest, so extra rest, more often than any team in baseball. Woodruff had the most starts on five or more days rest in baseball. Burns was like third, and Peralta was fifth, and Burns and Peralta have not pitched all the time. So like these guys are making almost every start on extra rest, and that kind of follows in the line of development where these guys were all brought up through the minors as starters, then eased into the big leagues as relievers, and now have, you know, ascended into complete dominant aces and are being supported uh, with being able to go, you know, maybe 95% instead of 90% every time they go out there because they have committed to you to doing this extra rest they've communicated it and they have stuck to it as opposed to kind of panicking and going back to we need you every fifth day as soon as everything goes wrong and and you know part of that is that they've had success developing guys that they can sub in whether that's hauser lauer brett they didn't develop brett anderson but they did find him and make him usable uh you know brent Suter's made spot starts yeah they have and been really good um, yeah, they have committed to the bit, and uh, I think it's, you know, who's to say how much exactly it's to uh, credit for the seasons Woodruff, Burns, and Peralta have had, but uh, I, I think it's a very, very admirable strategy that has worked out well for them. Yeah, I think at the time you wrote it, I mean, it was close to 50-50, if not more, that they made those that those three had made starts on, on five days rest, right? Like, more often than regular rest. It was more so often than not, yeah. Yeah. So I, it was a, it's a really interesting uh, thing that both, you know, that, that Rob had been tracking uh, kind of league-wide to some degree. And then uh, this is in his series, if anyone's going to look for it, of, of what is a starting pitcher. I think he's up to four parts right now. Uh, and, and then Zach at Yahoo uh, built on that, which, which was really interesting. Um, we'll take a quick break and be back with our last two topics. We're back with episode 168 of Five and Dive. Our fourth topic, uh, not around the horn, which it usually is. I want to talk about an article that ran yesterday 
uh, at Baseball Prospectus from Jonathan Judge. Um, he proposed an alternative uh, system for, I guess, compensation, uh, salary, whatever you want to, whatever you want to call it. Um, I know, I know I floated this to you, Zach, uh, before it ran, I gave you a little bit of a preview. I was interested in, in your thoughts on it. I, I'm still interested in, in you sharing your thoughts, uh, throughout I, the, the basic element of, of this, the, the basis of his proposal is that there would be a creation of a, uh, essentially a compensation, uh, salary pool, like a, or, or pool, a centralized compensation pool that the play look this would be the hard part of course that the players and ownership would agree on on an amount of money that the owners would would put in and that would be split up among the players and then the players would decide how it was split up to some degree the owners would decide who put you know how the money arrives to the players but as long as it did uh you know that that it would be split up on some basis of a base salary and then uh for players, it would be based on something like, you know, something formulaic like wins above replacement or, or you know, for BP, it's warp, whatever. Uh, it would be essentially be split up based on on how you would uh, perform in a given season. And the thing that really, I'm probably not doing a great job of explaining this and, and I apologize, but the thing that really messed with my mind on this was essentially completely divor- divorcing, like, what the players are paid from like there would essentially be no team payroll because it's just whatever the team contributes to this centralized pool each year but but after that it doesn't matter what your guys get paid which is a very weird way to to think about it uh a sports at least in in the american sport context like no no league works like this you know what i mean um it's i don't know i'm sure i left stuff out but but yeah i think i think you hit the high points I will say, so the the central pool idea, I think, is important, and even outside of the most, you know, kind of extreme changes that uh, Judge envisions here, you know, I think that's already a bit of accounting that MLB does not do that well, that other leagues are much more transparent about. Uh, you know, the NBA has a salary cap that is... Uh, tied to revenue and it adjusts based on what revenue is and players are guaranteed a certain portion of that. I think it's like 51% or something to that effect. And certainly that aspect of it is something that players and the union, I think, should be absolutely pushing for. And I, you know, don't doubt that they are uh, in getting that sort of, this is how much money uh, out of each season is dedicated to player salaries the the problem for them is that they understandably don't want to go to any system that involves a cap or that restricts the top level of salaries in any way. Uh, but if you're changing the system as much as Judge proposes, uh, the, the big thing this would theoretically solve, as, as we talked about before, Greg, is that young players right now who are producing just especially recently, out of their mind compared to how much they're being paid. And in some cases, like Ronald Acuna or Ozzy Albies are taking uh, extensions for financial security that are limiting their overall potential earnings, probably unfairly, definitely unfairly, because of the system that is in place. And this would change that by paying everyone basically on production of what they retroactively did. Uh, And that does seem more ideal. I think the, you know, the the qualm, a qualm or concern I brought up was, you know, he's setting up this system of the owners fighting each other and the players (laughs) fighting each other, which, to be fair, is better for the players than the players fighting the owners, which has gone very badly for a while. Yeah, uh, but I don't have a lot of confidence that the solution he proposes for the players is actually where they would land, and that yeah. worries me in the sense that veterans and longer tenured people in unions tend to dominate, and that would lead us to a place that isn't that far off from where we are now. 
Yeah. So so a couple of things I, I should note is that like the idea of a, a compensation pool is essentially setting a it is setting a salary cap, but it's also making the floor uh, a, a salary floor that is 100 percent of the cap. Mm-hmm. Which is similar to what the the NBA has. I think it's. I, I don't know the exact percentage what the floor is, but it's it's very close to to the cap. I, I believe. Um, and what yeah, what Judge proposes is a uh, a base salary of six hundred thousand dollars for every player. This is in his example. Uh, I imagine any uh, any that the union would decide among themselves would have tiered base salaries based on uh you know essentially the equivalent of service time but you know uh, tilted towards veterans you know what i mean I, I i can't imagine that they would would do an equal base salary across from you know the the from a rookie to someone who's been in the league for 15 years but that is the idea that that judge proposed but i think the interesting part is what you talked about um which is which is that Young players are generating the bulk of of the value, and I don't mean that like dollar per war value. I just mean war value Production. in the major yeah. leagues uh, right now, and they're not seeing that. You know, they don't they don't see that reflected in in their pay unless they survive for six years. And look, we the, the average major league um, career does not reach free agency. It's it's under six years, um, and so. The idea is that some of these guys would be able to capitalize on what they do uh, sooner is is an appealing one to me. I think the example he had he shows uh, 2021 regular season compensation, you know, through that this was published yesterday, so through mid September, uh, Shohei Otani has a 7.1 uh, warp for us. He's he's currently paid three million dollars for this season. He would get 27.48 million dollars. Uh, Vladimir Guerrero has, has 5.8 uh, warp this season. He's currently getting $605,000. He would get $22.6 million. Uh, and again, that's much, you know, the, the, I guess that there is a lot of risk in this for players in that like getting paid kind of retroactive to what you did is um, is complicated. Uh, and and potentially scary if you get hurt. Obviously, that impacts what you're able to do on the field. Uh, he does suggest some kind of of, of guidelines on on how that might be uh, impacted. But but I think the the flip side of that risk is that if you're Vladimir Guerrero and you have a career ending injury tomorrow, uh, you've you know, you signed multi million dollar deal in, in IFA, but let's say let's say you're Ozzy Albies and, and you hadn't signed your seven million dollar a year contract and you suffered suffered a, a major injury, uh, you know, you never would have been paid a significant amount of money over the major league minimum. And, you know, if you're Ozzy Albies under this uh pay structure, uh you would have because you would have performed very well for several years. Do you know what I mean? Like the, there are you know there's the 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 security is in if you perform you've you've been compensated fairly for it right and i think the i think for a lot of players that scenario and those like you know uh sort of gaming it out uh that would help and i think for others it would still seem a little bit you know it's hard to take your brain out of the situation you've been uh accustomed to and so a lot of players probably do see, uh, you know, one big season or a good contract year or whatever it is, uh, you know, a high prospect ranking as a chance to secure the bag, so to speak, uh, without the risk of having to tie every single thing to performance. And, and that is probably appealing also. But the current system makes that uh, more of a gambit than it ought to be, uh, especially, and it's hard to see how to adjust that system uh, reasonably to fix that so a new system might be the best way forward. I I think the other thing, you know, to pivot a little bit that uh, is unanswered about this for obvious reasons that it's probably not going to happen uh, is just the the wider scope of the game and the impact it would have on that. I I was reading, obviously, Marvin Miller, uh, the late Marvin Miller, went into the Hall of Fame uh, recently and 
when I was reading up about him to, you know, write some things ahead of his Hall of Fame induction, there was a lot about uh, the changes he pushed for free agency and the uh, the way the market works in baseball ended up being a win-win for everyone in that it changed the conversation about the sport, it changed the news cycle around the sport, and it, it revolutionized all sports in how that news cycle happens. And I don't, you know, I don't think that was his purpose, and I don't think that is uh, cha- necessarily changes anything about how good his work was for the players, but I do think the uh, lasting effects of it are more positive for the fact that it lifted all boats. And I don't know that this particular idea would lift all boats because I think it could throw the concept of player team connection into just complete chaos and limbo. And I don't really understand how that would work. Yeah, I I think that's that's completely fair. And I also, one of the things that we talked about was like, the, the likelihood something like this happens or not even the likelihood, but like feasibility of it. Mm-hmm. And it's I, to me, it's like not really feasible, but right. it's an interesting it's an interesting thing to think about. And I, I mean, I guess my my whole thing on on my response to rise, you know, a rising tide lifting all boats is like, I don't know that that's really happening now. In the current right. I think it's either. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I think I just wonder if if it's if we're just in a different era that has to be handled differently. I mean, I think the idea, you know, before there was a de facto cap in the luxury tax that that is probably accurate um, with that in place. I yeah, I, I just don't I don't think it is. I, I think one of the really fascinating parts of this is with free agency, which which doesn't get, you know, a ton of focus in the article. And I understand why that's the case. But uh, I think it becomes really complicated, but also really interesting to see how teams would approach uh, courting a free agent when it has nothing to do with money. Um, And we saw a little bit of this with Shohei Otani. Certainly Shohei Otani got kind of screwed in terms of the way that the uh, IFA structure works when he came over, and and I don't want to repeat that. But what I would find really interesting is, and, and did at the time, was like how these teams went about uh, trying to bring in a big free agent fish while not making it about how much they were going to pay him. Yes, it uh, it would... I mean, I don't think we honestly even know how it would work. It might be some level of... Well, for one, we know it would be a playing time derby. We know the playing time incentives, because of how the salaries would theoretically work, would incentivize players to go where they would play the most. That, Finally, that the Wilpon Mets have a chance to get something out of their free agent guarantees they gave to, like, Alejandro de Aza. <laughs> uh, that's a pull. Um, so, you know, you have... That part of it is obvious, but the rest of it, uh, which we talked a little bit about, is it would be a lot of soft factors. It would be, you know, come live in this city, come have this, you know, we'll give you seven suites for your family. We will give you 20 tickets to give to your friends every game. I, I don't know exactly what it would look like. We, you know. We will give you custom shoes. You know, I'm, I'm really not sure what it would, what it would entail, uh, but there would be some level of creativity that goes into convincing a player to join your team. Um, and, and, you know, I, I don't know how it would work with, like, do you promise it for a certain number of years? Like, how, I don't know how that works, and it doesn't matter, really. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it would all go into that in a way that is different from the pure kind of auction style that we have right now. Yeah, I think one of the, the more interesting things that could come of it is that I think playing time would be first and foremost, right? If, if these guys are going to have something based on, on war or something like it, um, you need to be able to, to accumulate uh, in addition to playing well. Right. And so, I mean, the example I used to you is like, you know, Chris, Chris Taylor is a, a, a pending free agent for the Dodgers this year. It's possible they bring him back in this super utility role that he plays 
most of a full season for, but all over the field, all that kind of stuff. It might be in his best interest to sign with the Marlins if they want to play him just at shortstop or just in center field or, you know, one specific. They could say, listen, we're not going to move you around and, and it's not going to impact you, the, you know, your formula the way it might. And you're going to play every game for us as, as long as you're healthy. Um, that might, you know, and that might actually be better for competitive balance in a way that doesn't actually harm the the labor pool, right? Like everything else that is claimed to be for competitive balance in, in when it's the draft or whether it's limiting salaries or whatever uh, does. But but in this particular circumstance, it, it it wouldn't really do that. And I think it would be interesting to kind of see the 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 uh, cascading effects that would have on how guys chose to to land in certain spots. Um, Again, there there are a lot of there are downsides to this, and I don't want to to overlook those or or act like they don't exist in the proposal. But I do think though these types of of you know if you tease out the thought experiment far enough, like that becomes really interesting to me. Yes, I think the competitive balance aspects are really really interesting, and it's hard to you know hard to come up with a way where it wouldn't aid in competitive balance. I mean, it would be legitimately difficult for any team to field uh, a roster as incompetent as, say, the Orioles, because you would just have major leaguers who want that playing time, and and unless, you know... And there's uh, no incentive for... They're paying what they're paying already. Right. There's no incentive to to field the worst possible... You know, there's limited, I guess, maybe if the draft remained the same as it was, like, there's incentive... But it's not nearly the incentive of I'm going to make you know cut my roster payroll down to the bone because you're you're paying that regardless. Yes, and the the only way you see the balance of revenue is if you are good and you make money off of you know the gate or you make money off of merchandise or you set yourself up for a better TV contract, assuming that's still a thing. Uh, you know, all of that would push you to just try to not try to not even, I guess, sign or uh, try to convince the best players you can to join your team. Uh, you know, I think the question is if there's any. You know, one of the interesting things is whether you end up with an NBA style thing where you get super teams of players who agree to take slight. Uh, slightly less playing time to ensure they win uh, a title or, or whatever the, the deal is. Although I think that sure. would quickly prove to not work that well in baseball. But Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I, I highly recommend, if, if people haven't had the time to read it, to, to go into it. Uh, I, I think, like I said, the, it, I don't know that I, I love it. But what I really liked about this article was that it, it made me think about all these you know potential you know, potentialities, I guess, is, is the way to put it. Um, and it it is free for, for basic, uh, basic subscribers. So all you need is an email to read it. You don't need to be a subscriber. Uh, and I recommend you do. Our last segment, uh, what to watch. What, what do you have on your slate over the weekend? What are you looking forward to watching? I don't know if looking forward is the right <laughs> word. Um, what, are you, what are you forcing yourself to watch in the name of uh, baseball coverage? Well, I am, I'm going to attend the Mets-Phillies game on Saturday, mm. uh, and um, that, that is going to be interesting. My, my girlfriend a is choice. a Mets fan. My girlfriend okay. is a Mets fan. I'm, and, uh, my condolences. Uh, yes. Uh, also, you know, like all Mets fans, I guess a bit of a masochist in that she wants to go to this. Um, but it, I, I'm interested in the Braves-Giants series. I think both of yes. those teams have... Uh, Obviously, a lot of incentive to keep winning right now, and the the uh, Do- Dodgers have also a contending team, but a flailing one in the Reds, and uh, you know that that Giants Dodgers race is just uh, extremely important. Uh, you know, in terms yeah, of one, the one outcome of the season, right now. Yeah. yeah, in terms of the outcome of the season, there's still nothing more important than that Giants Dodgers race, and so. Uh, yeah, beyond the Phillies Mets um, comedy show, I think the Braves Giants series is uh, is an interesting one to watch. Just uh, with the Braves are 
have been playing like a much better team since midseason or so, and uh, the Giants have been amazing the whole time. But if the Braves can steal a couple from the Giants, that could alter things a lot going down the stretch. Yeah, absolutely. Although it's, I think it's worth noting that I believe Atlanta dropped two to the Rockies. Uh, mm-hmm. Yet, uh, yeah, they split a four-game series with the Rockies um, recently. Uh, oh, that was at the beginning of of this month, and they just dropped two of three with the with the third game uh, being postponed before heading into this Giants series. So maybe the Giants are are catching. You know, it's interesting. They they've like I said, they they dropped two uh, at home to the Rockies, which the Dodgers did relatively recently as well. Uh, but then uh, they get a day off with a with a bad weather uh, yesterday, and so they get an extra day of rest heading into this Giants series. We'll see if they can kind of turn it around. Uh, you mentioned the flailing Reds. I will throw in uh, two flailing teams in the, in the Padres and Cardinals. <laughs> uh, I mean, obviously a lot at stake. Uh, in in that series, but neither team appears particularly good. Again, a half game separates them right now, so uh, certainly a big series. I will, uh, I suppose, I will be watching it. I don't know that I'll be enjoying it, but uh, yeah, I think otherwise that'll do it. Is there anything you'd like to uh, to plug at the moment, Zach? Before we head out, uh, no. You can find me on Twitter at zkreiser and uh, read the baseball coverage at Yahoo Sports. Definitely. Uh, th- well, thank you, Zach, for filling in as a co-host on this episode. Thank you to our listeners for joining us on this episode of Five and Dive, brought to you by the Baseball Prospectus Podcast Network and our Patreon supporters. You can support our Patreon at patreon.com slash five and dive, and you can get in touch with the show at five and dive at baseballperspectus.com. We are wherever you get your podcasts. Just search for Baseball Prospectus Podcast Network, and we'll be in that feed. Enjoy your weekend, and we'll see you next week.